But our first uh, presentation uh, this evening is by uh, Joseph Izang. Uh, Joseph uh, studied for his master's degree in conservation biology at the um, AP Leventis Ornithological Research Institute, Aptori in Jos in Nigeria. And uh, Joseph is currently the coordinator of the Arewa Atlas team. We've heard about the, the Nigeria Bird Atlas project um, and how, uh, how well they're getting on and what they've managed to achieve in a, in a relatively short space of time. Um, uh, Joseph, as coordinator of this Atlas team, is one of the key citizen scientists for the Bird Atlas project in Nigeria. Um, he assists Oscar Brutstrom. Um, Oscar has also joined us this evening um, and has joined us on, on, on numerous other CSH uh, evenings. Um, uh, Oscar being a lecturer and visiting researcher at the University of West Scotland and Cambridge University respectively. Um, Joseph assists uh, Oscar with the teaching of uh, master's students at Aplori. And this evening, Joseph will be telling us about bon butterfly monitoring in Nigeria. Uh, our last presentation, we heard a very interesting presentation on uh, the, uh, the approaches to but butterfly monitoring in, uh, in parts of Europe and the UK. And um, uh, butterfly monitoring, as, as we saw in that presentation, is, uh, is receiving popularity in, in, uh, in parts of Europe and um, equally so in Africa and particularly in West Africa in this case. Uh, this is uh, this is also um, the situation where monitoring is receiving popularity. And um, Joseph has conducted a study to quantitatively compare the effectiveness of the two most widely used protocols for monitoring monitoring butterflies. And this is specific to the sub-Saharan savanna habitats. So this evening, Joseph, welcome to you. And we look forward to hearing about the findings of your research and the recommendations that you have with regard to the most appropriate methods to use in monitoring the butterfly populations in the sub-Saharan savanna habitats. So if you'd like to share your screen, over to you. Thank you, Rick. And uh, thank you, BDI, and all those that are joining us today. All right. Thank you. Uh, once more, my name is uh, Joseph Izan. And uh, what I'll be presenting today is actually happens to be part of my uh, MSc research thesis at the AP Leventis Ornithological Research Institute. And um, that project was supervised by Oscar and um, the ACAD. Butterflies are one of the most widely spread taxa. They are found in all the continents of the world except the Antarctica. They are found in almost all the different habitat types and their ability to thrive and breed in small habitat, um, uh, habitat patches, as, as well as um, the fact that butterflies ecology is well known more than most other insect groups, makes them a very interesting and uh, 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 but, uh, insect group to monitor to, and to use in answering both ecological and uh, evolutionary questions. However, for butterflies to be used in answering um, ecological questions, scientists have actually developed methods to use in um, monitoring trends in butterfly populations. And by doing so, they will use those uh, such data to use it in answering ecological related questions. And, uh, but for a method to be used in answering ecological questions, it must produce um, accurate and uh, comparative uh, result in such that inference can be made without biases. And uh, such methods diff actually differs with methods generally differ with in different landscape. For example, in the UK, the polar swirl, which is a transit based method, has been used in butterfly monitoring. Whereas in most tropical countries like Brazil, uh, the bed trapping has actually been used in butterfly monitoring, where there are lots of uh, um, with uh, fruit uh, bits, where there are lots of uh, uh, fruit feed. In, uh, butterfly species. Uh, but in the West Africa to today, there is no known long time butterfly monitoring scheme, but it would be nice to have one, especially in the face of a biodiversity crisis. 
But to establish such long-term butterfly monitoring protocol is actually essential to know the methods that actually work best that will be able to produce result without bias. So that was, uh, that was the idea behind this work to evaluate the effectiveness of uh, different methods and uh, sub African savanna habitat, and also to see the cost efficiency of using such uh, different uh, methods, which method is most cost efficient. Because one of the major problems to ecological researches in West Africa is the problem of funding. So for this research, it was carried out in the Just Plateau, um, central Nigeria, in two sites. And the Just Plateau Eco region is um, Afro maintained vegetation within the Congolian and uh, Guinea Congolian and uh, regional transition zone. Within the Afro Montane um, uh, vegetation, there are many different habitat types, such as the hard crops, farmland, open wood and savanna woodland, wetland, and um, the rest. The vast heterogeneous habitat in this uh, eco region um, uh, support high, biodiv uh, high biodiversity. Um, for example, one of the sites uh, are, for example, Amurun Forest Reserve, which is a very small protected area where Aplori is located, just about 15 kilometers east of Just Town in mid, uh, middle belt of Nigeria. It's just uh, 115 hectares of land, but harvests over 300 bird species and over 75 um, families of insects. <coughs> the site, excuse me, the site is also known to harbor over 130 butterfly species. And it also harbor um, some very interesting species, including range restricted species and endemic species. For example, the Just Plateau in Digobe, and then the Rock Fire Finch uh, actually have a viable population in the reserve. Also, the reserve is also known to be the only site that still has a population of the Jewesilate Blues in Nigeria. The site is also known to hold some uh, in endemic uh, butterfly species such as the Jaws Zulu, the Rupert Zotted Border, and also the Kagaro Demon Caraxes. So, and uh, this actually and many other characteristics makes this uh, landscape the very best to carry out this research. The other side which we carried out this research, I carried out this research was Kwanga Farm. Kwanga Farm is actually located in Kwanga community. Kwanga community is one of the community adjoining the Amurum Forest Reserve. And it's one, it's one of those communities that the landscape is fast changing because of uh, increased uh, uh, urbanization, um, uh, grazing activities as well as uh, agricultural activities. For this research, we, I compared two methods and the choice, I, cho I chose these two methods because they are the most widely used uh, 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 protocols for butterfly monitoring. The first one is the polar work. The polar work is is a um, transit based method that is uh, entails the counting of butterflies within uh, a fixed route uh, in a five by five by five five imaginary cube while uh, the observer walk along uh, the transect. The second method we use, I used was the bed trapping and the bed trapping in terms counting of butterflies uh, captured in a trap uh, stuck with uh, beads. So for the experimental design, uh, Amurum Forest Reserve, which happened to be the smallest site, was uh, actually used for the baseline of this study design. Amurum Forest Reserve is already stratified into three habitat types, the savanna woodland, the rocky outcrop, and then the gallery forest. I further stratify Amurum Forest Reserve into grids of 100 by 100 meters uh, using QGIS and I use QGIS to generate the center point, the center, the coordinate for the center of each of those points. I randomly selected 15 grids from each habitat type. And for a grid to be considered to be in, one hab in, a, in, a, specific, in a certain habitat type, it must account for at least 75% of the coverage in in that grid. However, there was a problem getting 15 grids in the gallery forest. So I had to settle for two uh, grids in the gallery forest that had about 50 to 55 uh, gallery uh, forest uh, coverage. The coordinate generated for uh, the 15 selected grids were, were used in select and, and, and locating the grids in the field. And at the center of each of those grids, a uh, bed trap was mounted and also it served as a reference point for polar work. Each of the grid was visited four times, 
in four different days. And uh, data we uh, collected data for this project between October to December in 2020. And I better trap every day of visit. I better the trap at 7 a.m. and check them at 7 and check them at uh, 4 in the evening. And also polar work was carried out concurrently after be debating for each of the uh, grids. For each visit, only 15, 50 uh, uh, meters transect was uh, uh, covered. All butterflies seen within a five by five meters grid as the observer, as I walked along the transect were recorded and identified. To evaluate the cost efficiency of uh, using the, um, the protocol, three areas of cost expenditures were considered. And that was, um, this were the cost of equipment, which uh, include uh, all the cost of equipment required for a specific uh, method to be used. And then secondly was the cost of uh, um, personal, uh, the personal expenditure. And the personal expenditure was uh, based on, both based on the April 11th's uh, Ornithological Research Institute wages for um, uh, casual uh, um, research uh, assistant. And then lastly, the cost of bids. For this research, we recorded, um, I recorded a total of 2,995 uh, individual butterfly species in, um, 90, in 93, uh, um, belonging to 93 species and uh, across five families of the known six uh, families of Africa, of butterflies in Africa. The family Nymphali Day records the highest number of uh, both individual and species richness. The family Nymphali Day only rec um, accounted for over uh, for 42 percent of the total number of individual rec recorded, and also 42 percent of the total number of species recorded. It was closely fo followed by the family Peri Day, which had the second highest number of uh, individual recorded, about 41 percent, but lesser um, species richness when you compare the family Peri Day to family Lycani Day. Lycani Day has the second uh, um, uh, uh, highest number of species richness that accounted for 23% of uh, the species recorded in this study. The family Papillonidae had the least number of both individual and uh, species as well as the species richness. It accounted for just about 1% of the total number of uh, uh, individual recorded and 3% uh, of the total number of species, uh, of, uh, um, species recorded. During the course of these studies, Three new butterflies were recorded for the first time for the Aplori, or, um, Aplori region. And these are uh, 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 butterflies, um, uh, Azarnus Zibaldus, the uh, little um, pansy, and Karatis uh, three dates. Within the last, just a, a little bit um, from my what I did, uh, within the last uh, one, um, one year, we also record uh, three new butterfly species although uh, the monitoring is not um, uh, um, uh, standardized, just going to fill and then we've recorded three new species of butterfly in the reserve. And the course of this um, research, we, we found uh, 13 species of butterfly. So we recorded 13 species of butterfly that were exclusive to the gallery forest alone. And then twelve were exclusive to the savanna woodland, and the nine were only found. Uh, nine species were only found in the rocky outcrop. The three habitat types shared in common a total of thirty-six species. Also, the, the the protocol we used actually recorded some unique species. About eleven species were unique to uh, bed trapping, whereas sixty-seven were unique to polar trap. 17 of those species were common to the, for the um, two, um, proto and, uh, sampling protocols. And then for the site, we also have site differences. The butterflies, uh, 14 species were exclusive to Kwanga farms, whereas 34 were exclusive to Amorum Forest Reserve. Also for species uh, abundance ranking, there was actually different dominance in the different um, 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 study sites. In Amurum Forest Reserve, which is a protected area uh, by Cyclos Campa, happens to be the most abundant species. And then in the Kwanga um, farms, Belenois Arata happened to be the most abundant species. 
the abundance of um, um, Belenoise Arata in Kwanga could be attributed to the fact that um, this research uh, was carried out towards the end of the rainy season. And uh, that time is actually a very good time for migra migratory butterfly species. And uh, in my Murun Forest Reserve was phase survey. And uh, in the first week of our survey, no individual of uh, Belenoid of Rata was recorded. But by the last week of the survey, there were hundreds of them in the environment. This might have accounted for the higher number of uh, um, higher number of uh, Belenoids Arata in um, Akwanga Farm compared to Amurum Forest Reserve because Amurum Forest Reserve was face survey. And then for Bel um, by Cyclos Tampa, which we had more number in um, Amurum Forest Reserve, is because these species they are uh, their larva stage mostly rely on grasses. And uh, this, since uh, Amarum Forest Reserve is a protected area, the grasses are intact compared to uh, Kwanga farms, where um, there is high intensity of agricultural activities as, as well as uh, grazing activities going on, which has depleted uh, um, the grasses and then the resources for this um, um, species uh, to use. Uh, comparing the different protocol across the different um, um, habitats, we found out that irrespective of the habitat type, uh, polar work recorded significantly more um, butterflies um, um, abundance than the fruit baiting. A similar alphabet here would mean um, uh, no significant difference, but uh, different alphabet would mean significant difference. And you can see from all um, habitat type gallery forests, rocky outcrop, and savanna woodland, uh, polar work recorded significantly higher uh, number of um, uh, uh, um, butterfly abundance than um, the fruit uh, baiting. And this could be because uh, polar work is a transect based method which allows the, the observer to walk a distance and is able to see more uh, compared to the uh, bed trapping, which is, stat is, which is static. And, uh, uh, it can, and also, the bed trapping only attracts butterflies that are attracted to the base. And in this case, we use the, uh, uh, the, uh, the palmine banana fruit bait which simply means it only attract her members of the uh, 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 family Nymphalidae. Even in the family Nymphalidae, it's only uh, um, some subfamily that are attracted to um, the food baiting. And subfamilies like um, Danene, um, they are not attracted to um, the food uh, baiting. But uh, Pol Polar work is able to record all butterfly groups, uh, although it's um, a, a lot trickier with uh, some butterflies group and there's always a problem with uh, identification, especially with the likeness. Likewise, the species richness, um, both of um, um, polar work recorded significantly um, higher number of species in two habitat types, and uh, that is in rocky outcrop and gallery forest. However, it recorded it also record, uh, recorded significant um, more. Um, 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 species in the savanna woodland and the um, fruit baiting, but it wasn't uh, significant. To quantify our effort, um, the polar work here seemed to, um, based on this research, accumulated species at a faster rate than the, um, accumulated more species and at a faster rate than the fruit baiting. Uh, polar work accumulated at least um, uh, approximately three um, over three species per day, whereas the fruit baiting accumulated less than one species in a day. Likewise, if you look at it across habitat, it follows the same trend where uh, you have the, 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 the polar work in red recording more species and at a faster rate than the uh, fruit baiting uh, in black, uh, which are uh, recorded. Uh, um, fewer uh, species uh, per day or per effort. Uh, to compare the uh, cost efficiency of these uh, methods, like I said earlier, we consider basic, I consider basically three different areas of uh, expenditure. But um, the cost of uh, equipment was the single most uh, important uh, aspect of uh, this cost expenditure. However, the, the cost of equipment for polar work was almost 50 times the cost of equipment needed for uh, fruit. Um, uh, and the cost of equipment for fruit baiting was almost 50 times the. For personal wages, um, the, 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 the higher, the, the more time spent in the field due to um, mounting of traps, 
uh, going to check traps and then cleaning of traps further increase the, the field wages or the wages for the personnel undertaking polar work when you can for um, undertaking fruit baking checking that when you compare it to uh, that to the polar work. In other words, polar work and um, um, polar work or using polar work in both of fly monitoring costs less when uh, cost less when you compare it to uh, using uh, uh, the the uh, the, uh, the trapping uh, method and. Um, Generally, the finding of this, um, this research suggests that uh, indicates that polar work are a better protocol for monitoring both butterfly abundance and species richness in Afrotropical savanna habitats. The, type, the, the method is both time and cost efficient compared to, to the bed trapping. However, the polar work um, has an, a disadvantage in that it can only be carried out by experts or by people that are experienced with butterfly. Unlike food baiting that can be carried out with, by anyone that has the basic knowledge of field work. Uh, uh, because uh, the uh, later identification can be done either remotely or it can be done uh, at uh, when experts are uh, available to check the specimen. And also for uh, much, um, bait trapping will also be important uh, when uh, the study has to do with some sort of genetic uh, study or uh, catch and recapture um, studies. So with this, I recommend that the use of both methods should, uh, the bird method should be used for long time butterfly monitoring project because um, using the two methods reduces the cost of using individual methods, maximizes species sample and provide more robust ecological insight since the biases associated with using um, the individual methods are actually different. However, to establish a quick list for a given site or for a very short time butterfly project, I recommend that polar work should be used as this method accumulates species faster and also record all groups of butterflies um, compared to the bait trapping. However, for this to be done, experts must be, um, it must be experts that will carry out uh, such um, survey. I want to acknowledge the following people, my supervisor and then a fan here who um, happened to be my uh, field assistant uh, when I was uh, doing the research. Uh, Moses, my driver, and uh, uh, Dr. Sam and Dr. Talatu provided a very uh, a vital comment uh, when I was uh, planning um, um, this research. Thank you all for listening. Thank you very much, Joseph, um, for a, a very uh, well put together presentation and uh, um, I think that you presented it extremely well. So congratulations on that. Um, I think it's, uh, um, it's always interesting to see uh, how uh, this monitoring is done in, uh, in, in, in different parts of, uh, of the world, of Europe, of, of Africa. And um, yeah, well done on your, on your study and uh, on the presentation, as I said. Um, there is a question. Uh, the question is uh, from Chris Van Swy. Uh, did, uh, did you do this all round or only in one season? I think you mentioned that it was at a certain time only. Um, and, you know, what about having different results in a different season? Perhaps you could, could uh, answer that one. Thank you for the question. And um, like I said earlier, this, uh, what I presented was, is actually part of, was, uh, part of my MSc research thesis. And I had a timeline to carry out this research. Although there is actually a plan to, to, um, to, to do this, uh, maybe in different season to see if, uh, 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 the different protocol will respond in a, a different uh, way. Can I say briefly, we know from this area that if you go there in April, you would struggle to get more than 10 species. It is a huge difference at the end of the dry season. So deliberately to say, I, wouldn't, I don't think we would try and make this as a short master's project if it wasn't for that season. But just as Joseph said, we're just now working on a proposal to see if Aplora is interested in funding a long-term scheme, which will first be incredibly intensive just to see the variation over one year, to know at what level do we actually have to monitor continuously to, to pick up differences. 
And I guess also related to another question there about uh, did we get repeat visitors in that project, uh, Mark and Recapture will also be employed to get the first ideas of these things. <clears throat> yeah, the, re the reason I asked that question uh, was that I, I do a similar thing in my garden here. I've been basically under lockdown for the past 18 months. So I kind of do a little pollard walk every so often and uh, record the butterflies I see on my, on my app. And I, and I find that walking around the garden, um, yeah, I, I see all the, the Pyridae and the Lysini Day and various other butterflies in the traps. I've got, a, I've got quite a big gallery forest in my garden and I hang traps high. And there's a lot of Caraxes and Infalidae that I just don't see when I'm walking around that come into the traps. Some of the, some of the Caraxes like Varanis, yeah, they're in your face, whatever you do, but uh, it's very, very seldom, for instance, that I, that I see a Caraxes zelina at low level in my garden, um, or, um, or Caraxes drusianus. They seem to hang around in the canopy, and uh, you might see the odd one in one every six weeks or so. You put up a trap, they're always there. And what I also find is that, uh, and I don't specifically mark the Caraxes to, you know, you get to know them after a while because the same, the same characters turn up in the pub every day. And you know, the same, you're going to nick them the same place as the wing and everything. And I've, in fact, I've now got to the point where I don't, I don't hang the trap every day. Uh, I choose one like two day period in a month, and I hang it then. And that's because I don't like keep trapping the same ones all the time. It can't be good for them anyway. Um, and and it, and it also skews it skews the data as well because you think you're getting lots and lots of records, whereas you're getting the same Juicyanus every day for. For a month, which uh, which you know, it tells you how long lived the butterflies, but that's we, a completely. We question. actually there, there is a quite amazing record from uh, from Uganda in Kibala Forest where Euphedra medon was marked, uh, and then the same individual was refound in a very fresh shape, almost a year later. <laughs> Yes, so some yes. of these rainforest butterflies are insanely long-lived and um, probably because they basically feed on something that provides more than just nectar. So that's yep. one of those things we really don't know much about in Savannah. In Europe, we know very well how long our butterflies live. And uh, we don't know more in Africa that the rainforest butterflies have a capacity for more or less more than a year life. Well, we don't know in the Savannah yet. But we also know that there's very different strategies how they spend the the dry season, whether they hibernate as adults or as larvae, eggs, that all of those things will influence the actual lifespan. So that, that's lots that can be done from that. One little comment to Joseph. There's one thing I should have, I should have thought of that before because I read his project before. But one thing that I realized when I look at this, what is a bit interesting though with, with the trapping, the trapping gets less diverse than less numbers, but it reaches the accumulation curve levels out quicker, which in a way means that if they, at the end they would still tell you the same about the habitats the trapping would whilst it's more costly per day would require less days to get a quick estimate so that's something that might be worth thinking about in in future kind of when, when we continue to work on this i think that's why i say I, I do it i do it like two days a month mm. um and that seems to and even then i still get the same the same individuals coming back uh, there was another thing I did at work just for the hell of it. I had a uh, Telkinia um, um, Entodon uh, who always hung around the same corner of one of the buildings. So I caught him and I wrote in Sharpie pen and his hind wings, F-R-E-D. We called him Fred. And Fred hung around from April to October before he finally disappeared. Um, and I, I said, I'd like to do that again. He was in the same place every day. Very territorial, long lived. Um, so I think there's a, there's a lot of interesting work to be done on things besides population density. Um, there's no, no doubt about it, there's the longevity plays, plays a part as well. Thank you for those comments, Steve and Oscar. I think um, Joseph's presentation has, has, has definitely sparked some good discussion. John has a, a couple of comments to add. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks, Jess. It's really interesting, especially having been brought up collecting butterflies in Nigeria. Um, I just wanted to add that I did something similar to what you did in the Gambia when I was living there 10 years ago. I mentioned it a couple of weeks ago. And um, just while you were talking, I looked. I did a, basically a Pollard transept walk for the entire year. That's why I wanted to mention them. And at the same time, I had one trap, one fruit-based trap going for the entire year. I got 
63 species on the walk, 16 in the trap, with a crossover of nine. But it was interesting doing it for the whole year. I mean, as Oscar pointed out, in the dry season, there's very little. But there was no single day that I didn't get at least one specimen of at least one species. Um, the Naus chrysippus uh, was there all year, as I think was Eurema acavi salifera. I can't remember. But there were some species that were very, very <laughs> season specific. Biblia um, uh, Ambatara primary, I think it's called. Very specific period of time. And there are others that were there all year. Um, but one of the things I, I found interesting was, you know, talking about longevity. There were certain species. There was one specimen of Precus, I don't know, Genonia erythia madagascarensis. That, I mean, they're very, very territorial, as, as I guess you've probably seen. And this particular one sat on the same spot every day for three weeks at the same time of day. So um, I think it's, and I fully appreciate, you know, you're doing work for your thesis, but I think it's definitely worth doing this sort of thing for the whole year. because you do, you do get a real picture of what comes and what goes, what comes at different seasons. But even in the dry season, when you don't expect much in the worst of the driest, hottest weather until March or April, there's usually something to see. Um, so I just thought I'd, I'd, I'd mention that. And on the Euphedra front, I think there was one found in Ghana as well that was trapped marks and came back 340 days later, which corroborates yeah. what Oscar was saying. But one more small point, on my, on my trap, a couple of, I, I did it all year, but there were days where I, I either forgot to base it, so I was busy with work, or I'd been out of, off site. And there's one specimen of Melanitis laser, the um, evening brown. It used to fly along the hedge, come to the trap, I would catch it, mark it, release it. And on a couple of days during a given week where I didn't bait the trap, it flew along the hedge, came to the trap, Noticed there's no bait and then flew back <laughs> on the hedge without going in. So they're, they're quite, quite interesting and smart creatures. But um, anyway, I thought I'd just they're, they're not stupid. They're not stupid. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you so much. And uh, Joseph uh, and Oscar, all the best with, uh, with continuing with, uh, with this type of monitoring. I think it'll do some excellent results. Uh, I just think there's a, mainly uh, go to Joseph. He's the one's doing all the hard work. I sit at a okay. and look at photos <laughs> while he's out slaving away. He's brilliant. Very good guy. Fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, David Thompson just mentions that there's some mark recapture stopover models, uh, which which could be used to estimate mm -hmm. the amount of time butterflies spend, spend in the adult state. And then just a um, yeah a, a comment that I think makes sense. Um, a, a, a question, in fact. Um, uh, from Perpetra, just saying, do you think that the issue of taxonomy might influence an amateur's choice of method? Um, and I think that that, that, that makes sense, um, being able to identify, uh, you know, the, the butterflies that one sees down to species level might be difficult for, for um, somebody who's, particularly if there's a, a, a little bit of a complex taxonomic issue. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm sure you'd agree with that, Joseph. I, 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 I actually think, yes, it, it could actually affect uh, amateur's choice of the method to use. Um, even in my own research, I had quite a number of unidentified species, most of them belonging to the family like Kennedy and then Hasperidae. I had about um, 60, 62 unidentified individuals, and then over 80 of them were liking it. So um, yeah. with polar work, yes, uh, for amateur, there will be that, um, that challenge of uh, species identification. But um, yeah. that might definitely influence the choice of uh, the method uh, the amateur might decide to, to use. Because then if, if, if an amateur is using polar work, there is every tendency is going to miss a lot, or there might be a problem of misidentification. Yeah, but with, uh, yeah. Um, with uh, bed trapping, it will be hard to miss anything. Even if he can't identify it at the moment, pictures can be taken and then ESPA help to uh, make the identification. Yeah, yeah. Great, thanks very much. I think we'll close the, the discussion on the first presentation there, but thank you once again on a, on, a, on a very good presentation and best wishes for continuing with the study. I think it will produce wonderful results uh, in future as well. Thank you.